In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I am so glad to be with you all today and to get to preach to you today, be with you, really, um, because we are in Romans chapter 8, and in all of the Bible, this is my very favorite chapter of the Bible. And we've been in Romans chapter 8 for three weeks, and today is my favorite part of Romans chapter 8. So you get... Um, my favorite stuff. <laughs> Yay! I agree. Thank you. I am curious how many of you have been here for the last two weeks, and so you you will have read all of chapter eight of Romans. Good work. At the eight o'clock service, I have to tell you, it was almost everyone. But this is a good showing. Well, I am going to begin by giving you a bit of a quick tour of the book of Romans from one to eight, not the rest of the book. Because Romans chapter eight is like the gospel condensed and the book of Romans is a condensation of what Paul teaches in much of the New Testament. So the first six chapters of the book of Romans can be summarized as, got that? Don't do that. Or make sure you do that. But it's kind of, you get this picture. If you've ever studied art history or stained glass windows, Pictures of St. Paul tend to be of a rather stern-looking lawyer who, who has a finger pointed. My daughter is a librarian, and people think of librarians as, shh, right? Well, St. Paul is the, of the Bible. And he spends so much time with telling us what to do and not to do that many people don't like Paul at all. And I think that I have liked him better than that, but still have my problems with Paul because he is so sure of himself on what not to do and what not to do. And he's kind of coming down from on high until we get to Romans chapter 7. And this was a lesson the first week of July. And in Romans chapter 7, suddenly we have a bit of a converted Paul because he says these wonderful lines that are some of my favorite lines of the Bible that says, oh, I don't get it. The things that I know I should do, I don't do. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, I do them. Remember that? Isn't that just completely human? I call it the ice cream versus broccoli versus. I know I should eat more broccoli, but that ice cream calls me. And I know I shouldn't be eating ice cream, but the broccoli doesn't call. And that's Paul. And what he's doing in that chapter 7 is he's leveling the playing field. He's no longer Paul saying, ah, 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 and mm, mm. He's saying, we're all in this together. We all suffer from this human condition that ice cream versus broccoli. And then he comes to Romans chapter 8. And he starts with verse 1 of Romans chapter 8, which is, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God sets us free from the law of sin and death. We aren't condemned. If you eat ice cream, God is still going to love you. If you don't eat your broccoli, 
it's going to be okay. There's a freedom in that, a joy in that, an, an inclusion in that. And that's the beginning of the good news of chapter 8. Then last week, we move on in chapter 8, where Paul talks about that this love of God, this inclusion, this drawing us in, includes that we are heirs of God. We're adopted children of God. That's an amazing thought. Paul says, for you are adopted children of God, you can call God Abba. He says that in several places in the New Testament. Abba, Daddy. And as adopted children of God, you are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs. We have all the rights and responsibilities and joys of the beloved Son of the Father. And that's just good news. And finally, we come to today's incredible news. And there's three things to point out in today's reading from Romans chapter 8, which will work better if I turn the paper around. First, Paul says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All things work together for good. Now, some pastors, priests, will take that as everything is going to be perfect. You become a Christian and life is going to be perfect from now on. Thank you for shaking your head. I mean, it's just a uh-uh. That has any... I will leave the church if you answer yes, but has anyone experienced that your life has been perfect since the moment of your baptism? <laughs> no, not so much. But there's this promise that life in God is, is a, in the community, in the community of faith, that we walk with God. It's not that life is going to be perfect, but that God is in that with us. And we can trust in God. We can hope in God. We are secure in the knowledge that God will not let go of us, will not abandon us. The next incredible verse is, if God is for us, who can be against us? It, it's, it, there's this wonderful Old Testament story, and I, I wish I had looked it up and could tell you which wonderful Old Testament story it is, but there's this general who thinks he's all by himself out on the battlefield, and he turns around, and there's the entire army of God. The, all the angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven are behind him. And that's that sense that we have, that we have. We're not out there alone in this world, but we have the entire angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. We have God himself with us. Who can be against us? And that power, that promise of God to be with us. And finally, the last paragraph from your reading. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, says Paul. And this, if you, if you ever memorize any scripture, I think this is the scripture to memorize. I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I have a dear friend 
uh, who is uh, a so fit and so into the love of God, and she's been senior warden at her church for 20 years, I think. And she's a ballroom dancer and an amazing woman. And last November, she had a stroke that is debilitating. And she is in an assisted living facility. And she will not be dancing again. And she won't be senior wardening again. And she calls me every few weeks simply to say, what have I done wrong? God has abandoned me. I must have done something dreadful to deserve that. And what do I say to my friend Wendy? Neither heights, nor depths, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The grace of God, the love of God, the love of community. All, it, we, that is our permanent condition in Christ. Is that good news? Amen. Amen. That is good news. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news. You didn't have to answer the question, Teresa. <laughs> this is good. It is good news. The word gospel comes originally from the Greek language, euangelion. And you spelled E-U, which we make an E-V, is simply the word good. In angelion, we get the word angel from. And angel actually means messenger. So it is the message of good. The gospel is a message of good. And today we have good news. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, I could sit down and say, I can go from here and go to have lunch, have lunch with a friend and just say, ah, I can do whatever and God is going to love me. And nothing will separate me from his love. And that's true. But there's a call that comes with it. In our lives in Christ, we respond to good news. We don't just sit down and receive, but we respond by sharing the good news. And we share it with word and deed. We share it. Um, I, I was in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia yesterday afternoon, and there were about 40 people from a church with loud microphones and sandwich boards and tracks saying, Jesus loves you. And I went, aha, this is a little scary. They're clearly not Episcopalians. <laughs> but they are sharers of good news. But there are many ways other than that to also share the good news. And I'm sure that you have found some of those ways. I participate in a feeding program at St. Dunstan's where we feed about 400 people a week. And we do it without tracts and microphones, but we share the love of God in food. And there are ways with food pantries and caring for your neighbor and prayer and so many ways. How is God calling you and Redeemer to share the good news that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Amen.